since, from what I understand, based on previous years, all of you are students who have a uh, particular interest in sciences, right? Is that, a, is that correct? Yeah, uh, that mean a yes or that mean a, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you, yeah. Um, and I wanted to talk a little about what we do combining um, archeology span and the various sciences in a manner that is both interesting and also quite unique uh, and uh, even to a certain extent even uh, unique in the world. And I might add that uh, if any of you feel an interest in looking into any of these aspects of combining archaeology and science, uh, we do this every year. You can come and work with us in the field in the summer. You can come and work with us during the year in the lab. Um, if you're interested, um, you can go to my blog, wordpress.com, gotwordpress.com, and, and uh, look it up. Um, okay, um, just a couple of uh, basic things about the site we're working at. The site we're working at is called Telesafi, which is identified as Gat of the Philistines, uh, the hometown of Goliath, of Goliath. And it's a large site which is situated more or less halfway between Jerusalem and Ashkelon of today. And it's uh, on the border of what in modern terms would be the, uh, the southern coastal plain. In biblical terms, uh, Philistia. And it's, it's just on the border between the area which would be considered where the Philistines lived in the, in the, in the first temple period and the Israelites and Judites who lived in the, in the central hills. And there's an area in between, which we know today as the Shvela, the foothills, where most, if you think of most of the stories that deal with the connections with the, between the Philistines and the Israelites occurred there. That's the area more or less of Beit Shemesh today. Um, and if you think of the story of David and Goliath, uh, the story of Samson, et cetera, et cetera, please come in. Uh, many of these stories occurred here. And the reason being is that when the Philistines were strong, they pushed east. When the Israelites were strong, they pushed west. And then there was a seesaw relationship between the two. And this site, Tel Asafi, is just on the border between the easternmost part of Philistia and the Shvela. So when the Philistines are strong, there is a lot of connection between the city of Gat and the Judites, and when the, Phil and the Judites are strong, and even at one point, they even take out over a uh, goth of the Philistines. And, and we see this through many, many uh, ways. Now, uh, I'm not gonna show you all the parts of the site, but just give an idea of the enormity of the site. This is 100 meters down here. That's 100 meters uh, scale uh, right over here. And this is one of the largest sites in Israel. And you can see we're digging in all kinds of different areas all over the site, spread out. And in fact, the YU team was over here, if that's uh, important. Uh, now, like in many um, ancient sites in Israel, there's a very, very long history. And this is what we call a tell, which is a site which is comprised of layers upon layers upon layers upon layers, starting from prehistoric periods, ending in a village that was abandoned uh, in 1948 during the Israel War of Independence. And I'm not gonna go through all these uh, levels, and you probably even can't even see the table, but we have all these different cultures, periods um, represented on the site. And of course, we don't excavate all of it. We can excavate all of it. I mean, even after, we've been working there close to 20 years, and if, I've, if we've excavated 2% of the site, maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating grossly, uh, and clearly we only give a, a sampling of what's going on. Now, what I wanna do is talk a little about less the finds directly, but more about all kinds of methods that uh, we've been uh, implementing re in recent years in the, in the field. To a large extent, when I think of uh, what I learned as a student in archaeology uh, a long time ago, too long ago, I don't even think of how long ago, um, when I, I always remember the point when my students started being younger than my children, then I realized I was old. Um, so it's a long time ago. Uh, so anyway, it's what I learned as a student, how to excavate, how to analyze finds, is to a certain extent, it would be like comparing medicine in the 1900s, and, or excuse me, 19th century, and medicine today. It's the same field, you do the same thing, but the toolbox is completely different. And this is very much what's happened in archeology, span um, at least I would say in the cutting edge side of archeology, span in the last uh, 10 years or so. And, and for example, as you can see here, we're not only analyzing finds in the laboratory, 
which they've been doing for 100, 150 years. But in that case, it was usually you'd excavate, you'd just pack up things in a box and you take them back and weeks, months, or even years later they would be analyzed in the laboratory. And if and when you do get a result, you can't go back to the field and say, okay, now that I have a result, let's excavate different, let's look up, let's find more materials that will help us understand this aspect. But rather today, we're actually bringing the labs into the field and trying to have um, a set of analytic techniques that we can actually bring to us into the field, have analyses on the spot, and enable us to give at least partial answers right in the field. So if you find something interesting, you say, okay, this is interesting, let's stop now, let's analyze it. And based on the preliminary results, which can be given in, in, in some cases in minutes, we can say, okay, this is very important, we have to excavate this or that way, we have to send more samples of this, we have to be more meticulous in the excavation, et cetera. And, and I'll be showing you a few examples of how things that otherwise would simply have been excavated away within a few minutes and disappeared, we now have the ability to do it, uh, to, to really work with it. And, and just an example of some of the equipment that we actually take in the field, this is an FTIR, um, a Fourier Transform Infrared spectro Spectrometer, which actually gives us an ability to, um, more or less on the molecular level, to uh, characterize various materials. We have an XRF, um, which also, a portable XRF, which is the size of sort of like a, um, I don't know, um, you know, like the things that they, they put stickers, you know, I know it, uh, the barcode reader. More, the, more or less the size of a barcode reader, which you can, um, you basically point it at something, you zap the, uh, the material, and it, you get a, uh, an atomic level um, a reading of the, uh, of, of the material you're looking at. And this gives us a, a very wide analytic ability in the field, and as, as well as uh, microscopes, etc. And all this suddenly changes everything and how we're doing it. And we're trying to implement this in a wide, um, uh, range of aspects and for example for years the method of documentation that we use in archaeology is quite simple uh, as I always tell um, first year uh, students who come to the excavation for the first time field archaeology is not rocket science well it's starting to be rocket science but it used to be basically you have to learn how to use a pick and an axe and a shovel and a hoe and once in a while a brush and a, a little uh, trowel uh, and then you have to know how to write down the basket number and what the find was and the height of the object that you found, et cetera. But now we're trying to bring in things that really, to a certain extent, do turn it into rock and sites. And one of these uh, aspects that we're using is much more sophisticated documentation. And what you see here is a scanner, uh, which is a 3D laser scanner, which is known sometimes as LIDAR scanners, if you've ever heard of it. And what this gives us the ability is to not only produce a plan, which is two-dimensional and very, very um, simple, but rather to start giving us three-dimensional recreations of what we're excavating as we move on and eventually to, to recreate the three-dimensional views of, of the past. So, so for example, if we um, excavate a building more or less the size of the, 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 the shape of this red uh, structure you see over here, I can then at a later stage recreate this into a three-dimensional view uh, in, a, in a very sophisticated manner. And um, the main problem with this system is that each of these things cost about $100,000, so there's a limit in how many of them uh, you can buy. And also there's a limit. One of the problems in archaeology, and since you guys are interested in, in the sciences, you may not even be aware of this issue, um, archaeology is by most people considered to be in the humanities or in the social sciences. Humanities and social sciences uh, traditionally don't get very much money for, uh, for, uh, for, archaeology, for scientific funding. We're trying to move ourselves into the sciences where the, where the bucks are. So uh, for this thing, you need the bucks. Um, now, uh, another very, very important thing is context. Uh, I'm sure when walking in the old city, you've all been in the old city, you've seen the uh, antiquity stores, right? Well, these stores would sell all kinds of, uh, you know, old objects. Let's say most of them are, are actually real. You know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll give them the credit of the doubt. Um, but to a large extent, we can learn very little about the past from just studying the objects themselves, not in their context, not in where they were found, not in, in, what, um, in what contextual picture they give us. And it's very important as we 
um, if we want to become better in archaeologists, is to look into a very contextual uh, viewpoint. And that means that if you're excavating something, for example, these vessels coming out over here, you can see them in various stages of excavation. It's just, it's not just, wow, we found a couple of vessels on the floor, let's go put them in the museum, but let's start understanding what was found in the vessels, what was found underneath the vessels. We can look at the contents of the vessels, or in, for example, in this case, we can um, uh, get an, an samples for carbon-14 analysis, which nowadays we have extraordinary abilities to give accurate datings based on carbon-14 analysis. Or for example, you see this alleyway over here that's marked off over here uh, by analyzing um, even on theory, we now throw away our garbage in a very, very um, a nice manner, even though in the end it gets just dumped off somewhere. In the antiquity and in traditional societies, what do you do with garbage? You open the window and you toss it out into the alleyway. Uh, uh, so by closely analyzing an area such as an alleyway, you can get a very nice view of what people ate, what people threw out, what people how people made things, what they did eat, what they didn't eat, what type of foods they ate, et cetera, et cetera. And this can be done. And you know, one man's garbage is another man's uh, uh, feast. And in this case, it's very much uh, true. And this can only be done if we pay attention to the very small details. Now, uh, just a brief note on, um, on the Philistines. The Philistines arrive in Canaan around 1200, slightly after 1200. They, came to, they come to Canaan just about the same time as the tribes of Israel appear, more or less at the same time frame, which in the terms of archaeological periods is the end of the Late Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. And during this point, there's a very big transition because in the Late Bronze Age, the world is a very, very well-connected international world with, with all kinds of trade connections and diplomatic connections between the, the entire ancient Near East. And just about after 1200, all this comes apart. And among the various things that occur when this comes apart is on the one hand, the Israelites appear, and other groups such as the Arameans and the uh, Moabites and the Edomites, etc. And on the other hand, uh, groups come from the west and settle along the coast, and one of the groups is called the Philistines, and they settle in the southern coastal plain of Canaan. Now, why is this important? Because when we look at the archaeological remains from five, from levels dating to the period after 1200, we can see very clearly the appearance of the Philistines. Why? Because when people come from outside of a region, they bring with them all kinds of new things. Whether it's how they eat, how they make their houses, what they wear, their religion, their writing, etc., etc. And I'm going to bring some examples now of how we can see this both macroscopically in a more traditional method of archaeology, but also microscopically uh, using the various uh, sciences. Now, a very interesting find that we found last year in the excavation was uh, we were excavating in an area with date, dating to about 1100 BC, and suddenly someone noticed this round circle starting to appear in the ground, and it was soon understood that we have here, <coughs> excuse me, an ivory bowl, which was then excavated out in one big block, and basically taken out and then sent to the conservation lab. And in the conservation lab, it was excavated. And then in the conservation lab, we came out with this beautiful ivory bowl, which is almost complete. It's missing a bit of the side over here. Uh, and it's, it's a very interesting object. Besides the fact that it's a beautiful object, there's several very important things that we can learn from this. First of all, it's made out of elephant ivory. And basically, if you imagine a large tusk of an elephant, they cut off slices, and each slice was then made into something else. Now, interestingly, this bowl was found at Gat in the southern part of the land of Israel, and a whole bunch of other bowls, very similar to this, were found at Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley, and they were excavated in the 1930s by the by an expedition from the University of Chicago, and a few months ago I was in Chicago and I went to examine these bowls from, from the Megiddo excavation. And they're apparently this, made by the same artisan from the same tusk. Now, that's a nice idea. And here we start using the sciences. And what, they, what they, we know now is that for reasons that have nothing to do with archaeology, for, uh, to fight modern poaching, there is an enormous database of isotope analysis 
of uh, ivory from throughout the world. And with, with this modern database, you can, if, if you find a, uh, an ivory object in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, I don't know, a shop or anything like that, you can identify from where that tusk came. And South Africa, the Congo, um, Asia, where the various types of Asian elephants, etc. And what we're trying to do now is we're going to take a sample from our bull, a sample from one of the bulls from Megiddo, send it for isotope analysis, see first of all are in fact the two bulls from the same tusk, and then also try to see where this tusk come from. Now, I don't know what's, it will work because it could be that the isotope profile from 3,000 years ago is different from the isotope profile of modern ivory, but this may be, give us a very interesting thing. And then we might get an interesting, uh, some interesting insights. For example, if this ivory tusk, let's say, turns out to be from an elephant from India, we know that sometime before 1100 BCE, the time of, of this, this find at Tel Safi, someone brought a tusk of an elephant from India to us, to, to us, to, to, to the land of Israel. And why do I know that such things could happen? Because <coughs> we'll see in a moment, we conducted another type of analysis on vessels. This is what's called organic residue analysis. It turns out that if I had a cup made out of ceramic, not out of plastic, and I had some sort of a organic material inside the cup, now, if you leave it out on the table and let 2,000 years go by, what happens? The, basically, the, the liquids evaporate and the organic molecules, um, you know, decompose, right? Agreed upon. It turns out that not always that happens. And what in fact happens is sometimes some of the organic molecules, particularly the lipids, um, get absorbed into the matrix of the ceramics. And in certain um, cases, you can actually identify the specific lipids, giving signatures of specific materials that were, uh, <coughs> that were in these vessels. And when we analyzed a few of these vessels, it turned out that in some vessels, we had incense that, among other things, was made from cinnamon and nutmeg. Now, anybody know where cinnamon and nutmeg comes from, besides from the supermarket on the, on the, uh, on the shelf, you know? Cinnamon, nutmeg, anybody know where it comes from? Yeah. Sri Lanka. So it means that someone 3,000 years ago, I don't think he got on a plane and flew to Sri Lanka and flew back to Israel, but there was down the line trade. But things were getting from all the way in the Indian subcontinent all the way to the Levant, the area of Israel, um, through trade. And so if cinnamon and nutmeg were, were getting here, who knows, maybe ivory was getting here as well. Another thing that we, we want to learn about very much is more about the Philistines. The, the, who, were the, who were these people? And one of the things we know for sure is that the Philistines died. There's no doubt about it. That was a joke, by the way. Um, and boy, you are um, a really uh, reactive crowd. Uh, um, and uh, <laughs> um, it's the middle of the day, you know. Did you give them beer in the morning or something like this? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, he, and one of the problems is that we have very few Philistine burials that have been excavated um, since the beginning of archaeology. Fortunately, we managed to uh, excavate a tomb which was partially um, robbed out by a Bedouin who lives right near the tail, but nevertheless, part of the, uh, the, ex the uh, remains were found. And this is me playing a Philistine uh, burial. And here's a group of finds from the, from the tomb. And um, in addition to the finds, all kinds of interesting things, we had a nice collection of bones from the, uh, from the, ex from the uh, excavation, which based on a count, there were at least 70 individuals or 76 individuals in this burial. Now, what can we learn from um, the bones? Several things. First of all, we tried DNA analysis, but it only works if there's good collagen preservation. So far, it hasn't worked. So we, we don't know anything about their DNA, although we are working on other bones to try to get a, an idea of who were who the Philistines, where they're from, where from, et cetera. But analyzing their bones, we could see several things. For example, based on their teeth, it, they, it, the, uh, the physical anthropologist could say it's a, it's, it was a large family because uh, many of the teeth had very specific genetic markers on them, forms which clearly indicated a, a family connection. And another thing, then we did 
isotope analysis of the bones, and it turned out that these people were very, very sickly. They lived a very short life, and they ate horrible food. And we can see this through both the, the physical analysis of the bones and the isotope um, analysis, and it turns out that to a certain extent, as anybody who's studied the past knows, is that there's this sort of romantic vision of the past that because we drink Coca-Cola and eat a lot of hamburgers, um, we're very unhealthy and our life is horrible. And if we just go back to the, uh, the Paleolithic diet or something, some other, you know, um, expletive deleted, uh, you know, uh, 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 idea of how you should be li living, then everything will be fine. Well, that's a lot of you know what. Uh, um, I mean, there is a lot to correct in the way we eat and what we do and how we uh, live our lifestyle, but going back to living the way people lived uh, uh, thousands of years ago would mean that you live a very, very painful, uh, sickly life and die around the age of 30. So um, just, a, just a good thing to, uh, to remember when people uh, tell you, you know, let's go back to old times. Um, okay, now, a very, very interesting thing that we got at the site is the ability to look at the daily life, and this is important. We often think of archaeology as finding the palaces, the temples, the, the fortifications, the, the, uh, the big gold object that Indiana Jones takes off the, uh, the pedestal and runs away with it. You know, that's a, that's, we don't usually do that, you know, and, and uh, although the, 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 the pretty women are always running after us, it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't usually happen. Um, but what we do get is, for example, how they live their life on a daily basis. And one of the things we see, for example, with the Philistines is that when the Philistine culture appears slightly after 1200, we can see all kinds of changes in daily life. And this is especially seen in life in the house. And to a certain extent, as today, what you, what, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. And very much of the daily life is connected to preparation of food, eating food, disposal of garbage related to food, etc. And one of the things that we see is that as opposed to the Canaanites and the Israelites, before and after the arrival of the Philistines, who when they would cook their food, they would make a, a mud, uh, or a dried mud uh, oven, which we call in modern terms a taboon or a tanur. The Philistines would cook their food on an open, round hearth made out of pebbles. And they probably would put the vessels right next to or right on top of it. Now, besides the fact that suddenly we have appearance of these round, Hearts, which tell us that it's, it's a Philistine site, it's different from the Israelite or the Canaanite sites. But it also probably means that they cooked different types of foods in different types of vessels, <coughs> using different types of, of fuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And from studying this, we can get a nice idea on who they are, what they were, what they're eating, what they're not eating, uh, etc. And so, for example, studying uh, this aspect, we can compare what it is a daily life in a Philistine village as opposed to daily life in an Israelite village. And here's an attempt to study the, um, the temperature at which the stones were heated, the fuel that was used to try to recreate it. And a student of mine even went to Uzbekistan where they cook in a very similar method to try to understand how it's done uh, you know, on an ethnographic basis. All this trying to recreate the, um, the uh, daily life. Now another thing we see is that when the Philistine culture appears, uh, we can see that the Philistines ate pig meat and ate dog meat. Now I don't know if they were that pigs and dogs as cute as these, but they did. We see this in the bones that we find in the archaeological sites. Now first of all this is a very interesting thing because uh, again it's usually at Israelite sites and Judite sites you don't find pig. Not always, but you know, just like today, not all Jews don't keep, not all Jews keep kosher, so apparently the same thing can be said in the past as well. Um, and by the way, the lack of pig in Israelite sites uh, during the uh, First Temple period is perhaps the earliest evidence that we have outside of the Bible of the beginning of the formation of the rules of Kashrut, which we, this is a, a uh, an excellent example of it, but recently we found something very, very interesting about the. Okay, the Shevet Baksha. Okay, we.
okay, this is a, um, that the pig bones that we analyzed um, were sent for um, DNA analysis and it turned out that, um, I mean I'm sure my grandfather, if he, 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 he would realize that I was dealing with the, the DNA of ancient pigs, I wonder what he would have said. But um, it turns out that the, the pigs that we see in, the, in this region of the land of Israel are pigs that from a, uh, the wild pigs that is, that the boars, they have a, a European genome. That means they have a European DNA. While wild boars that live in Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq have a unique genome typical of the Near East. Now, when we started analyzing pig bones from the various periods onwards, from the Bronze Age onwards, we could see that during the early Iron Age, slightly after 1200, suddenly the European pig genome appears in the, uh, in the local uh, region. Meaning that apparently when the Philistines arrived from wherever they arrived, probably on their ships, they brought with them squealing pigs, landed with them, the pigs lived in the Philistine cities and eventually also got out into the fields, crossbred with the local pigs and eventually their genome took over from the uh, and became the dom dominant genome of the, uh, of, the, of the pigs in this region. Now the fact that something that occurred 3200 years ago can still be seen in the, in the biological record today is quite fantastic. And this, by the way, is an example of how sometimes the, re the, the remains that we find archaeologically can actually have an impact on our understanding of, even of the current uh, times. And another example of, of a, something that we can see only from the microscopic level, we found a group of, uh, of floors which were covered with plaster. Big deal. So what? It's plaster. A lot of periods they have plaster, but it turned out when we conducted an analysis of this plaster, this plaster is something that we call hydraulic plaster. As you may know, most plasters or um, paint or whatever, cements, in order to uh, become hard, have to, ha have to be in contact with the environment, with air, with, uh, with, uh, to, to, to go through the, the, the chemical or, um, process that, that hardens it. There are certain types of plaster which can do this underwater as well. This was something that for many years it was assumed that was invented by the Romans, like, you know, a thousand years after the Philistines. Now we found this at Philistine sites, and it turns out though that we find it at a Philistine site, but this actually is a type of plaster which was invented in Greece just around the time when the Philistines came. So it means this is an example of a technology brought by the Philistines from Greece, and without the microscopic viewpoint that we now could bring into, into archaeology, we, we wouldn't be able to uh, see this thing. Okay, now, let me go on to an example. We talked about the, the, um, the organic residue analysis, and these are just examples of vessels that were found at the site, and uh, in such vessels, which were used for incense, we find uh, the nutmeg and the cinnamon. Um, and another very interesting find that we have is in the lower city of the, of the site, that means this old here, area over here, we found a temple with tons and tons of remains and in the temple we found this very beautiful uh, altar uh, which is quite unique and I'll talk a little about it and uh, what's so special about it. I'm sure you all know an Arba Karnota Mizbeach, the four horns of the altar. Very, very, um, one moment, I'll, 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 give, you, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll give you an opportunity to ask a question in a moment. Um, this is a typical type of uh, altar of the Israelites. We have many of them for many, many sites. What's unique here is a couple of things. First of all, this guy has only two altars, two horns. Another thing, very interesting, is that the size of the altar is 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters by just over a meter, which if we turn it into amot, is an ama al ama al amotaim komata, which if you go to the, um, uh, if you go to Shmot Lamed, in the description of the, uh, of the Mizbeach HaKtoret in the Mishkan, 
that's exactly the same size. And so what we have here is on the one hand an altar which is very reminiscent of the Israelite altar or, or an Israelite altar, uh, both in shape and in decoration, but instead of having four horns, it has two. And that's interesting because when we go to uh, regions such as Cyprus or ancient Greece, we find altars with two horns only. And this is a very typical thing of the, Isra the relationship between the Israelite and the Philistine culture. There's intermingling and uh, influence from one another. And a very nice um, illustration of this, think of the story of Samson. Now, when you think of the story of Samson, we usually think about the fact that he killed the Philistines, and in the end, he was killed by the Philistines. But that's the dominant theme, right? But if you think onwards, he married a couple of Philistines, he was, went to Philistine uh, weddings, he, he, was, uh, he had a lot of other things besides just killing Philistines. And this we can see from the archaeological record as well, that on the one hand, there is evidence of confrontation and being two sides of the same story, uh, uh, two sides of the, of, uh, two enemy sides, but on the other hand, a lot of connections, and if you want to, um, Israelis and the Palestinians today are very much the same. We fight as we unfortunately are doing nowadays, but we also eat the same food. You're eating falafel. That's not, I hate to uh, break the myth, but falafel is not an Israeli food. Um, now, uh, another very interesting thing is right next to this altar, we found all kinds of cool uh, objects, a, a figurine of a dog, a, uh, an incense, and we found a big a jar about this size on it, this size, a jar about this size, and on the jar there was an inscription that's in ancient Hebrew letters said something like Aleph Bet Taf Mem, Avitam or something of the sort, which is an Israelite name. It's not a Philistine name. And when we did analysis of the pottery, it turns out that this jar was made in the area of Jerusalem. So someone took a jar, named, wrote his name on it, and brought it as an offering to a Philistine temple. You know, now that doesn't fit in, you know, with the, with the official line of uh, the story, but it just shows us that this, these interactions were much more complex and um, multifarious than, that, multivariant than, than we uh, think about in, in the past. And this is just examples of all the very, very um, wide ranging, uh, I would say, new. Um, insights that we get from working on, on the one hand, archaeology from the macro perspec perspective, but on the other hand, archaeology from the, from the micro's perspective. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> now, there was a question back there. Yeah, um, do we know where the Philistines came from? Excuse me? Do we know where the Philistines came from? Well, um, that's a, first of all, it's a great question, because for many years people have been trying to say, oh, the Philistines came from um, Greece or Cyprus or ancient Turkey, etc. Nowadays, uh, it seems more likely that the Philistines were a group which was, com which was comprised of various peoples coming from various people abroad, whether it's Greece, Crete, uh, Cyprus, Turkey, the Balkans, etc. And when they came here, they also settled and lived with the local Canaanites. So they formed a unique uh, we like you use a term called an entangled culture. And in fact, it may sound funny, uh, I just published an article with someone in which we suggested that perhaps some of the Philistines actually might have been pirate-like groups. So, by the way, you know, um, a Philistine pirate, what's the, his favorite letter? Oh, come on, you don't know this, you know. R, no, it's not R, it's the C. Uh, anyway, um, uh, um, anyway, so, so, and why pirates? Because if you look at stories of pirates like Blackbeard, etc., <laughs> it's usually a charismatic leader leading a multicultural group, not of one um, origin, and preying on uh, areas which there is not a central authority which is strong enough to really hold the line and make sure that you don't have uh, um, you know, people marauding from the sea. And this would fit in very nicely with the situation just at the transition between late bronze and the Iron Age. Yes, someone else, yes, please. This is kind of a broad question, but you said something like kind of resentment either from like old school archeologists who think that archeology mm -hmm. has become too scientific or from the scientific community who thinks that they're trying to kind of pose as too scientific. 
Um, uh, what can I say? You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> For the first part, yeah. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's an uphill battle, yeah. Uh, now, there, um, many of the, I would say, uh, let's say many, some of my colleagues would prefer to continue doing archaeology as we did 20, 30 years ago and make believe that all this expensive stuff that we have to and all the research grants that we have to write, et cetera, just don't exist and we can do, just do what we, you know, we did way back then. Um, but I think the, uh, the more time passes, the younger generation that comes into the field realizes that that's the direction we have to go and we have to have a much more uh, multi and, uh, and inter um, a disciplinary approach in archaeology because if not we're wasting our time. And has like the scientific community become more accepting of your methods and stuff or is there also kind of some pushback? Well, um, when we try to use scientific methods, we try to use the most up-to-date scientific methods. We're not using science of the 50s, you know, um, uh, we're using trying to use science of today. Um, the one, one battle that we have is that, uh, that we have to convince, for example, the, the um, the Israel Science Foundation that uh, they should allocate more money for archaeology, uh, uh, but you know we're getting there. Yeah. Please. Yeah, you start. Yeah. Do you find that with the development of these new could you? Uh, Sorry. Do you find that with the development of these new technologies, it calls into question some older discoveries that have been previously taken as fact? Um. Well. Um, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, for many, many years, uh, people read the biblical text in Sefer Shmuel and, and said that from based on Sefer Shmuel, um, there was uh, a monopoly of um, metal production by the Philistines. You know, that it says that, that the Israelites had to go down to the Philistines to buy their, um, their metal tools. Um, the problem was is that up until uh, just very recently, nobody had ever found any metal production sites in, in Philistia. Um, both this year and a couple of years ago in our excavation, we found uh, metal production sites. And how did we find it? Because we were much more meticulous in our excavation and something that could have in 15 minutes of working with a, a shovel have been tossed off the side of the, uh, the, uh, the tail and disappeared. When you're working meticulously, you suddenly have a completely different way of finding things that otherwise would simply disappear. So that's one example. Um, uh, let me try to think of another example uh, where we've completely changed our understanding. Well, um, uh, a nice example is um, there's during the Late Bronze Age, I won't, uh, there's a certain type of um, uh, pottery vessels which was called the bichrome pottery. It's a pottery vessel, it's a type of pottery family that has a very nice uh, red and black decoration on it. Now, most of the pottery um, in the land of Israel in the Late Bronze Age is horrible looking. It's like the potters didn't know what they're doing. And for years they said, well, there was one family of potters in Canaan who knew, knew their, their trade and made great pottery. And then they analyzed this pottery uh, using um, physical techniques and it turned out that this pottery is made in Cyprus. So suddenly it turns out that this whole story, it's even though they look local, they're not local. And, and, and we have these uh, things happening every once in a while. A nice example is the, is the cinnamon and the nutmeg. Who would imagine that a th at 1000 BCE, there would be any connection between Israel and this region and India and that region. Of course, if you, if you read the uh, biblical text and you read about the, the, the Queen of Sheba, so people say, ah, Queen of Sheba. How could someone from Yemen get to the land of Israel, you know, at 1000 BCE? And here we see uh, a connection which is three times, um, uh, you know, broader. Okay? Yes, please. Similar question, sorry, about things. Number one, with the altar that you showed us, you said that it only had two of the horns on the sides, but it looks like on the other side, two might have been broken off. Well, um, first of all, again, good question. Um, it, they looked that it might have been broken off, but in fact, you can see that the, the entire altar was made from one piece, big piece of stone, and the, the back part was yet in a in the unfinished stage, as if they had, had the, the first quarrying out of the of this stone from the from the actual quarry. And so they do very, very rough quarrying, and then only they bring it in and they finish it up. And the back part was never finished and it didn't break off. It's, it was still at the pre-finishing stage. Okay. And then you mentioned like you, you're only really uncovering about 2% of the tremendous area yeah. there. Um, is there ever any concern that between only kind of dealing with 2% and all these new technologies that 
anything that you're finding now, you could be making up some story, and then later on, everything could be totally over. Well, um, first of all, I, you have to look at two sides of the story. One is, on the one hand, yes, but listen, uh, statistic sampling is part of any science. I mean, we're never, you know, if you want to prove the theory of relativity, you don't go to every single um, atom in the world and check it whether that will work there. You're doing it in a, on, a, on, a, um, on a statistical manner. The same thing goes for archaeology. On the other hand, we say we don't want to excavate um, an entire site unless the site is about to be destroyed because we know that in 50 years archaeology will have tools which are much better than the tools of today and we want to leave for the future generations the ability to come and say oh Professor Mary he didn't know what he was talking about uh, everything he wrote is completely wrong I'll prove him so uh, wrong so you know go ahead let's let's do that yes um, have you seen like um, any kind of like biological difference um, or kind of evolutionary uh, or whatever, or like, um, something to figure out, like, if you see different generations from the past, like, bones of, bones or, like, rubbish. Well, um, uh, let's see, the, um, from a physical anthropological sp point of view, um, the, um, the modern humans have been basically the same for the last, I don't know, 300,000 years. I mean, and the changes have been, have been minor. But there are, um, minute um, evolutionary changes that you can be even seen on a much shorter sc uh, scale. And for example, the, um, um, for example, the, the fact that uh, some communities, in, uh, uh, some human communities, particularly in Northern Europe, have an ability to, uh, to absorb uh, milk products and while most humans don't, is an example of a, of a, of a local you know, uh, evolutionary development. And, and the same thing goes for um, the you know, bacteria and their ability to, with, you know, to, uh, to, to you know, not be, uh, I'm, I'm thinking in Hebrew now, um, you know, that antibiotics don't work against them. So that's also a, a very short-term um, evolutionary perspective. OK, other questions? Yes, please. For the uh, hydraulic plaster, so how do we know, uh, what leads us to assume that they specifically came from Greece? Excuse me? It, what, how do we know? It didn't come from Greece, but the knowledge comes from Greece because this is a type of technology we don't have in this region, uh -huh. and at the same time we have it in Greece. Oh, so, we just so it's not that we have the, you know, it's not as if we have a textbook and it says anybody who came from Greece do this and this and this, but since it's so unique here and found over there and we know that some of the Philistines came from there, then it makes sense to assume that there's a connection between the two. And that was another question about the altar. So yeah. it's also significant to us that like it was made out of stone because like the Torah emphasizes like not making helium out of you know. Well, first of all, we do have um, uh, several uh, Israelite altars which were made out of stone. Uh -huh. um, some were made out of one block of stone, some were made were out of blocks of stone. Um, we don't have any evidence of an altar found so far uh, that was, you know, cut by the Shamir, you know, the, 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 the magical um, a worm. Uh, uh, so. I would assume that the altar described in the, in the biblical text is a unique altar that was in the temple, which doesn't exist anymore, but there are other altars all the way around. And I'll, and I'll keep in mind that the picture presented in the biblical text is the picture of the, um, let's say, of the Rabbanot Rashid, when you're using modern terms. There was a lot of things going on besides what the Rabbanot or Rashid was saying, or the Badats or something of the sort. And, and the archaeological picture gives us a picture of all kinds of other things. And for example, you know, you know idol worship, you know, the worst thing that you can think of in the, biblical, in the biblical text, we find all kinds of little figurines and all kinds of Israelite sites. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that, that they, they were not against idol worship, but it means that the, the fact that they're writing against idol worship means that there were people out there doing it. So the same thing goes for the altar. Yes, please. Um, you're talking about all these ideas about, you know, a person does it, it, based on what it sounds like, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're saying that when people do in archaeological digs, so people find these things and they connect the dots and they, and they have theories about how things work and whether that becomes accepted or not, I don't know. But my question is, like you have a textbook you learn about ancient history and it talks about all these, you know, things they found and there's ideas of how, how these cultures work. So when does something go from being the idea that one archaeologist had in the field to being in a textbook and does that actually, does it being in a textbook even mean anything? Maybe it's just... Well, um, okay, uh, you know, that's a good question and uh, the uh, uh, hermeneutics of knowledge, okay? Uh, um, the, 
in any field of science and, and, and of inquiry, whether humanities, etc., there is a certain amount of, 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 of knowledge which grows and then it becomes accepted. And one of the things that you see that a, a you know a field of science is is a, is a uh, vibrant field is when you're constantly throwing old uh, you know uh, ways of thinking about things out out the window. And I think. If we look at archaeology th throughout the last 50 years, um, things have changed a lot. And I am sure that a lot of things that we're uh, are saying and are accepted today will be thrown out the door um, as well. Nevertheless, th the more we uh, have a wider um, body of knowledge, which more and more examples of the various things, that enables us to say, okay, we can choose between this and this, but all the people that say that, I don't know, that that uh, people from outer space came and built the pyramids, you know, et cetera, et cetera, those we can put aside. And we're, we're I would say, we're limiting the field to, to more, I would say, more sane <laughs> approaches to science uh, as you do in other things. So it could very well be that some of the ideas we're espousing today will be, she will be seen to be wrong, but we're still, we're, I would say, with, within a certain ballpark, which, which is, I would say, well, well, better and better defined with time than, than just like, everybody can say. And, and by the way, one of the fun things in archaeology is that uh, there's this idea, people have this idea that if you read a text, one book in archaeology, or you have a cool theory, you know, that's what you, know, you can write it. So I, I about once a month I get an email from someone who can explain to me where Atlantis is and where the uh, Arona Kodesh is, you know, Arona Brit is, etc. And, 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 and sort of not realizing that ar you know, archaeology is based on a lot of sometimes very smart people um, working very hard for the last 150 years and it's not just a fly-by-night you know, uh, idea. So you do have no question about development of, uh, of, of, the, of the field. Um, but it's, I would say, we're turning it more into more a, um, I would say, a well-anchored uh, field. And again, compare medicine over the last few centuries, and medicine has been around for 3,000 years. You know, we've, well, let's say, uh, let's say as a science a little before it, but, and what people were saying about medicine 500 years ago, um, no doctor would take seriously today. But they still were doing the same thing, trying to heal people, and, we're, and they're slowly moving ahead. Okay. They accept the risk. I mean, I'm just thinking of like uh, I had a high school textbook, right? And in the textbook, they accept the risk that what they're saying, they're accepting that they're giving this as the facts for a generation to know, with the understanding that it might be wrong. Uh, yeah, and I think I, listen, uh, it's more so. In, listen, if you go to chemistry, I mean, uh, you're you're a, f a chemistry physicist. Yeah. Okay, so do you even, I mean, somebody who's a, who's a, a scientist, do you even look at articles written 10 years ago? They're barely looked at even nowadays, you know. So the same thing, you know, in, in archaeology, we even go back to the textbooks from 50 years ago and say, okay, this yes, this no, because nevertheless, there's a lot of data in there. And, and the sciences, I mean, anything 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's not even worthwhile looking at. It's just, it's an interesting, uh, you know, uh, history, of, history of, the, of science and not more than that. Okay? Anybody else? Okay, last question. Do archaeologists have any tools to like know where exactly to dig? Like any like new technology that will occur now? Well, um, one of the things we use in archaeology a lot is remote sensing, and that's what you're probably referring to. Is if I, if I want to understand where to excavate so I can see remains on the surface, but I try to use things such as ground penetrating radar and magnetometry, et, et, et cetera, to um, to try to see below the surface. And by the way, one of the things that archaeologists and geophysicists are trying to help um, uh, the Israeli army nowadays is, is, is with methods to try to discover these uh, tunnels on, underneath the uh, surface and perhaps maybe we'll be able to help uh, there a little. Okay. okay.